Hi, this is Oncology for Medical Students with a video on hypercalcemia as part of a series on oncological emergencies. This video will cover a bit of the pathophysiology of cancer-related hypercalcemia, the common symptoms and its management. Firstly, to help our understanding, we'll go over a bit of the basic physiology of calcium regulation in the body. Calcium is an ion that is vital for the structure and strength of bones. It also has an important role in cellular processes. This includes blood clotting, muscle contraction, neurotransmitter release, intracellular signal transduction, and second messenger systems. Calcium in the blood can exist in a free ionized form, which is active in cellular processes. Or it can exist bound to large negatively charged molecules, mostly albumin, which is not active in cellular processes. Total calcium levels are the sum of both ionized and albumin-bound calcium. However, this isn't necessarily a useful number because it doesn't tell us how much of this is bound to albumin and isn't involved in cellular processes. Calcium levels are normally expressed as corrected levels. That is, that they're corrected for the amount of albumin in the blood. If albumin levels are low, there won't be much calcium bound to it, and more of the total calcium will be ionized and active. Our uncorrected level might be low in this case, but we might have a normal level of ionised calcium. The corrected level will therefore be higher than the uncorrected level and fall within the normal range. Calcium levels in the blood are normally tightly regulated at around 2.2 to 2.7 millimoles per litre corrected. Hypercalcemia can be defined as high levels of calcium in the blood. Definitions vary from laboratory to laboratory, but in general, serum levels of over 2.7 millimoles per litre are defined as hypercalcemic. The main organs involved in the regulation of blood calcium levels are the thyroid gland, parathyroid glands, of which there are four that sit on the thyroid gland, bones, kidneys and the small intestine. When calcium levels rise in the blood, this is detected by the thyroid gland. As a result, specialised cells in the thyroid gland called parafollicular cells release a hormone called calcitonin, which has a number of effects in bringing calcium levels in the blood down. For a start, calcitonin encourages deposition of calcium into the bones, shifting it out of the bloodstream. It also reduces the reabsorption of calcium by the kidneys back into the bloodstream, meaning that calcium is excreted into the urine. When calcium levels in the blood fall, this stimulates the parathyroid glands to release parathyroid hormone. This has the effect of mobilising calcium from the bones into the bloodstream, as well as increasing calcium reabsorption from the kidneys, and also increases the level of activated vitamin D, also known as calcitriol, which in turn stimulates the small intestine to absorb more calcium. All of these measures increase the level of blood calcium. This system of interaction between the thyroid gland, parathyroid glands, calcitonin and parathyroid hormone ensures that the level of calcium remains within the normal range, allowing for the normal continuation of physiological processes that involve calcium. Hypercalcemia develops in 20-30% to 30 of people with cancer and is often referred to as hypercalcemia of malignancy in order to distinguish it from other causes of hypercalcemia. Unfortunately, it usually signifies a poor prognosis. It can be seen in most types of cancer, but most commonly is associated with myeloma, squamous cell lung cancer, breast, kidney, and head and neck, and prostate cancers. The most common cause of hypercalcemia, which is responsible for 80% of cases, is the release of a hormone called parathyroid hormone-related protein. As the name would suggest, this is a protein hormone that is very similar to parathyroid hormone. As a result, it has very similar effects in increasing calcium levels. Parathyroid hormone-related protein release is common in squamous cell carcinomas of lung, head and neck, as well as renal, bladder, breast and ovarian cancers. It's actually a normal protein expressed in a lot of tissues, including the breast, where it facilitates calcium transfer into breast milk, amongst many other functions. It shares some similarity in structure to parathyroid hormone, therefore is able to bind the same receptors. In regards to calcium metabolism, its most profound actions are in the release of calcium from bone and reabsorption of calcium in the kidneys. 
It's worth noting that unlike parathyroid hormone, it does not tend to lead to the production of calcitriol, also known as activated vitamin D. Therefore, you don't get a significant increase in gut absorption of calcium. Typically, blood tests will show you a high level of parathyroid-related hormone levels, low parathyroid hormone levels, and normal to low calcitriol levels. The next most important mechanism is the development of osteolytic metastases. This means metastases, which we know are tumours that have spread from the original tumour site, that are able to break down bone. This effect is actually the result of proteins that the tumours release that increase the activity of osteoclasts. These are cells in the bone which break down bone tissue. Typically, you'll get low parathyroid hormones, low or normal calcitriol levels, and a low or normal parathyroid hormone-related protein level. The final mechanism is the production of calcitriol, the active form of vitamin D. This will of course lead to increased gut absorption and therefore a higher level of calcium in the blood. This is commonly seen in lymphomas, especially Hodgkin's lymphoma. Symptoms depend on how severe the hypercalcemia is and how quickly its onset is. Often in malignancy related hypercalcemia, it's both severe and rapid onset, leading to significant symptoms. A common way of remembering the symptoms of hypercalcemia is the rhyme stones, thrones, groans, bones, and psychiatric overtones. In addition to this, we'll add cardiac on the end, which unfortunately doesn't rhyme, but we need to include the important cardiac symptoms. Stones refers to the development of kidney stones. This, however, is more common in people with long-term high calcium levels. Another kidney-related symptom includes polyuria, or passing a lot of urine. This is because high calcium levels impair the kidney's ability to reabsorb water back into the bloodstream, known more specifically as nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Thrones refers to this as well as constipation, which also commonly occurs. Groans refers to abdominal groans. Anorexia, nausea and vomiting are common gastrointestinal effects. Hypercalcemia can also lead to peptic ulcers and pancreatitis. Bone pain is very common, especially in those with bone metastases. Muscular weakness is also frequently noted. Psychiatric overtones, anxiety, depression, and cognitive dysfunction, which includes confusion and problems concentrating, often also occurs and tends to improve with the treatment of hypercalcemia. Not mentioned in the mnemonic, but important nonetheless, are the cardiac effects, which include bradycardia, hypertension, and a shortened QT interval. AV nodal block has also been known to occur. In rare cases, can lead to heart block and cardiac arrest. At levels of less than 2.8, millimoles per litre, symptoms are only likely to include polyuria, thirst, depression and mild cognitive impairment. Above this, but below 3.5, you might see muscle weakness, fatigue and nausea. Only really above 3.5 will you see the most serious side effects, abdominal pain, vomiting, lethargy, coma, pancreatitis and arrhythmias. Kidney stone formation, as we mentioned, is only really seen if high calcium levels are long-standing. In terms of your examination, there aren't really any specific signs related to hypercalcemia. Therefore, anyone with the above symptoms should be investigated for high calcium with a blood test. In many cases, it will already be known that the patient has a cancer when they're found to have high calcium, but this isn't always the case. In any case of hypercalcemia, cancer-related or not, the most useful initial test is a parathyroid hormone level. If the level is high or the upper range of normal, this suggests primary hyperparathyroidism. This almost always indicates the cause is a benign tumour of the parathyroid glands that is releasing parathyroid hormone rather than a malignant tumour. If the levels are low or low normal, then a parathyroid hormone related protein and vitamin D metabolite tests might be helpful. High parathyroid hormone related proteins suggest a cancerous cause. High calcitriol might be due to a cancerous cause, but could also be due to increased calcitriol uptake or kidney production.
High vitamin D levels suggest vitamin D intoxication as a cause. In terms of treatment of hypercalcemia of malignancy, if the hypercalcemia is mild, which is normally defined as less than three, no active treatment is usually recommended. But avoiding factors that might rise calcium levels, including medications or dehydration, and high levels of dietary calcium are usually recommended. In moderate hypercalcemia, which is a level of 3 to 3.5, if chronic, again, might not need immediate treatment, but if acute with a quick rise and symptomatic, might need treatment. Severe or symptomatic hypercalcemia, which is a level of over 3.5 millimoles per litre, requires emergency treatment. In the first instance, this is rehydration and will normally include intravenous fluids. Other treatments can include calcitonin, which will lower the levels of calcium in the blood. The calcitonin that's given in treatment is calcitonin that is extracted from salmon. Bisphosphonates, including a drug called zelendronate, are also used. This is a class of drugs that inhibits the activity of osteoclasts, which are the cells in the bones that normally break bone down and release calcium. Bisphosphonates, however, take a little bit longer to work than calcitonin. Their effects aren't usually seen until about two to four days after their introduction. In very severe cases which aren't responding to these medical therapies, calcitonin and bisphosphonates, it might be necessary to use haemofiltration in an intensive care environment to lower the calcium levels. So, in summary, hypercalcemia of malignancy is most commonly related to tumour release of proteins, most often parathyroid hormone related protein, but it can also be caused by osteolytic metastases and tumour release of calcitriol. Symptoms can be summarised up with the rhyme stones, thrones, groans, bones and psychiatric overtones, but don't forget that hypercalcemia can also have effects on the heart. It's most commonly seen in myeloma, squamous cell lung cancer, breast, kidney, head and neck and prostate cancers. If it's very severe, it's treated with IV fluids, bisphosphonates and calcitonin. And in cases that don't respond to these measures, haemofiltration. Thanks for listening. As always, your comments and questions are much appreciated. Goodbye.